Uh, hi everyone and thank you so much for joining us today on this webinar. Um, as Jeff said, I'm Erin, I'm Head of Finance at Shares and we have a great panel of guests today to talk to us about um, emerging trends. So we're here today to hear from three experts um, and they'll be talking about the fields of tech, renewable energy and carbon. And we're seeing huge momentum in these areas and today we'll be looking to fill you in on the key opportunities in developing trends in each of those sectors. Um, so how we're going to structure this webinar is we'll start with a quick five minute intro from each of our panellists and they'll tell you a little bit about their background and their current role. Um, and once we've completed those intros, we'll move into the panel discussion. So each panellist will talk for around 10 minutes on their sector and the emerging trends in that sector. And once we've finished those presentations, we'll move into a bit of a Q&A session. Um, so if you could use the Q&A function in Zoom to ask your questions, we'll then run through those questions at the end of the presentations. Uh, so I'll kick off with introductions, and it'd be great if we could get John to start. Thanks, Erin. Um, hi, everyone. I'm, I'm just making sure I'm off mute. Um, that'll be a disaster. Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name is John. I am a managing partner for Global From Day One. So just to give you a little bit of context of Global From Day One, uh, Global Day One is a venture capital firm. We've been in existence since 2012. We invest in uh, young New Zealand B2B technology companies that are growing fast and going global. At initial check, we typically invest in companies that are doing around one to $10 million in annual revenue. They're led by ambitious founders that are taking a swing for very, very large markets. So US, Europe, and Asia in particular. Uh, overall, our core focus is to help create more Kiwi-founded, made in New Zealand, billion dollar success outcomes like the Zeros, the Push Pays, Rocket Labs, Sequence, and so on. We've seen some um, decent success stories coming out of New Zealand lately. So underpinning our strategy um, is the fact we call ourselves technology generalists. And you know what does that mean? It means that we invest across five broad verticals. It includes internet 2.0, 3.0, hardware-enabled software, SaaS, uh, health tech, and deep tech. Um, we're currently raising fund three. Uh, we're significantly um, uh, oversubscribed, but we're leading up to 160. Uh, we're going to be closing the next two months. Um, but with 160, we're, we're looking to invest in around 20 portfolio companies. Uh, we look at well over 400 companies each and every year. So that's around three to five companies every week year that we invest in. So we are disciplined and very selective as to the type of company that we invest in. Um, as far as value add, there are two things. First of all, we invest capital into these companies. And for every $1 of initial investment, we also invest around $2 for follow-on investment into our best performing portfolio companies. Um, so we help supercharge them that way. But also, we sit on the board of most of our companies. Um, but we always help each company with value-added initiatives. So it could be our networks, it could be our experience, our background, anything to help maximize their value onto the next stage of financing leading up to uh, a public exit, such as on the IPO or a st strategic acquisition. As far as uh, GD1 is concerned, the team, um, we're all very much unique individuals. We've got a diverse team of um, people with backgrounds as engineers, operators, finance professionals, but most importantly, like people that have founded companies. And I think that's something that we're really proud of because we understand the founder journey and the challenges that they face on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, from my perspective, uh, most of my professional career has been in London. I was there for 14 years. Uh, I spent the first three years working for a hedge fund, a very well-known hedge fund called GLG Partners. I was a front office equity, equity analyst. Um, so building models, forecasting, have a deep understanding for uh, the financials and due diligence of companies that we invested in is basically uh, my core role. Um, I didn't really have a huge passion for investing in liquid e uh, listed equities. I really wanted to kind of move towards uh, the founder journey, early stage tech, um, be closer to the cult face. So I thought the best way to get access to venture capital in general was to um, move to um, a pension scheme where I managed around 1.5 billion pounds investing in and alongside the best performing venture capital and private equity managers globally. So over a period of eight years, I traveled through Europe, US, Asia, just meeting with 
building relationships and getting a better understanding with for how venture capital managers not only source their deals, but how they um, added value and also how they kind of position themselves themselves for exit. And that was really, really critical for me. But also now we have a, a decent Rolodex of connected tissue to offshore um, VCs. So for our companies, when they're at a certain size and scale and they need strong um, capital, um, these are the kind of relationships that I'll be introducing them to. So a lot of capital and also access to local customer target markets. So that'll help our portfolio companies as well. Um, as far as VEC is concerned, why am I doing this? Um, it's, it's an incredibly unique asset class. Um, I'm inspired by the opportunities that I see on a day-to-day -day basis, a lot of exciting change in the ecosystem. Um, and I, I think I just love being part of the founder's journey. Um, it's exhilarating. It's based on hard work, scaling companies. The value is always in the team, right? The, it's always in the team. But on the other side, it's, it's, it's real risk. It's a lot of indecision, a lot of mistakes. Um, but, you know, overall, if, if you're helping them plug the gaps and, and building these companies, then ultimately, um, you know, we're obviously looking for ultimate um, global winners, which is what we set out to do. Um, but, you know, it's, it's interesting kind of um, helping these companies scale from you know, something very small to something very, very large. Um, and also focusing on product team and culture is, is incredible. The New, the New Zealand ecosystem, it's, it's amazing. Like it's so active, um, tremendous deal flow. Um, and, you know, I'm super proud to be, um, be, be a part of it. Thanks, Erin. Thanks, John. Looking forward to hearing who you think the next global winners are coming out of New Zealand. Um, we'll go over to Rebe Rebecca next. Thanks, Erin, and uh, tēnā koutou katoa. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be part of this webinar today. I'm Rebecca, the Head of Renewable Development for Meridian Energy, and I lead Meridian's team investigating grid scale, wind, solar, and battery developments. And I'll be sharing a bit with you today about the drivers pushing growth in renewable energy and opportunities that that presents. Uh, many of you will be familiar with Meridian, but to give you a few of the stats, we are one of New Zealand's largest listed companies, listed on both the NZX and the ASX, um, employing around a thousand people across New Zealand and Australia. Um, the New Zealand government is our majority shareholder at 51%. We're New Zealand's largest electricity generator through our five wind farms seven hydropower stations and commercial solar arrays. In Australia, we own two wind farms and three hydropower stations, and that's under Meridian Energy Australia. The group sell electricity to our customers through three brands, Meridian and PowerShop in New Zealand and PowerShop in Australia. And we have a couple of really exciting subsidiary companies. One is an energy retailing software company called Flux Federation, and they operate in New Zealand, Australia, and the UK. And that software is also licensed to NPower in the UK. Um, we own Dam Safety Intelligence, which is a dedicated group of engineers, scientists, and geologists who are focused on safe management of dams and other water infrastructure. And this is where most of my history lies, uh, with a background in civil engineering and a previous specialty in dam safety. Um, I was the founding general manager of Dam Safety Intelligence as a subsidiary in 2016, and um, did that for three years before leaving over 20 years of dam safety to move into the parent company and lead the growth in our renewable development team. Um, so yes, yeah, civil engineering, and I also have um, a master's from the London School of Economics. 
and I take great delight in telling people how hard that was for an engineer moving into a completely different sector. Um, and I had the privilege of being there during the global financial crisis, which also just was a mind exploding experience. Um, but my research there included the political economy, um, global public policy on construction and multi multi stakeholder processes. Um, so yeah, some nice links. And prior to all of that, I started my career at the Electricity Corporation of New Zealand or ECNZ um, prior to the creation of the competitive electricity market. So I was around for that transition in 1999 from ECNZ into Meridian, what was then Mighty River Power and Genesis. Yeah, so look forward to talking to you more today about um, the, the demand and electricity growth that is projected and that we're seeing now and uh, the challenges of the energy trilemma. Nice to, nice to be part of it. Thanks, Rebecca. What an incredible career you've had so far. Um, and over to Colin to introduce himself as well. Thanks, Erin. Hi, everyone. Thanks for, for having me along today. Um, as you can tell from my accent, I'm, I'm, I'm not from around here. So if anybody has a little bit of difficulty uh, understanding me, you can join the queue that's headed by my wife. Um, so uh, I, yeah, I come from Glasgow in Scotland. Uh, I uh, spent the first 24, 25 years of my life there training to be uh, a chartered accountant. I am a chartered accountant. Um, and once I qualified, I decided oh, I was going to do a little bit of a world tour uh, and travel uh, and gain some experience in different sec different markets, different sector sectors, different cultures, um, which your chartered accountant qualification allows you to do. Uh, and so the first stop was New Zealand and I came out here in 2009. Um, and uh, at that point, I... Uh, did a lot of work in the, in the in the public sector, just kind of understanding that, uh, and and particularly with the, in in the insurance, um, set part of Ernst and Young. Uh, when I got here, I I, I bumped into a, a Kiwi girl, and um, my plans for a world tour kind of ended at that point. Uh, I and um, I decided what in between going back to the UK for a couple of years. Um, I've been here for good, so and that's a, a fantastic thing. No regrets about not traveling around the world and understanding different cultures, but uh, New Zealand's a fantastic, fantastic place to live, fantastic place to work, and I'm, I'm really grateful for being here, particularly at this, at this time. Um, what, what I've done since I've got here, really, is I've, I've got into the, under the bonnet in a number of different businesses. I really love um, putting... Uh, what makes a business successful together, mainly from the back office, the systems and processes, but it's amazing how often that um, simple infrastructure and getting that rate right is fundamental to, to, to building the success of a business. And along the way, um, I bumped into a number of people, um, predominantly uh, qu quite a few investment bankers. And a couple of years ago, I was uh, I was introduced to a number of people who were setting up Dryland Carbon, uh, and I was asked to help put that that business together. And what what Dryland Carbon does is essentially it's a a fund that that has been established by four, four large emitters in in New Zealand, um, who put uh, capital together to invest in establishing forests on um, marginal, rough, tough uh, hill country throughout New Zealand for the purpose of generating carbon credits uh, that uh, our investors can use to meet their climate change obligations. And that gives them a bridge. And what we'll, we'll talk about it, I'm sure, quite a bit today. It provides them a bridge as to solving their technolo technological challenges over time, because you can't introduce new technology just like that. You need to um, do it in a staged manner over time. So uh, the purpose of our business is to provide them the carbon credits to meet those climate change obligations in the interim while they're trying to solve that long-term problem. So we've got a team that uh, go uh, right across the country looking for land that is suitable for forestry. 
uh, and uh, what we do, we invest in it. Um, we either partner with landowners um, to, to establish the forests, or we buy parts of, of um, marginal farms to establish forests, plant the forests and, and take care of it, registering it in the emissions trading scheme and generating those, those carbon credits. Um, and as you, you will talk about a little bit later on today, the price of carbon has um, risen significantly over the last few years, and it makes it even more compelling the, the, the reason for us to do things such as this to help us meet um, what our targets are over the next 10, 20, 30 years. Thanks, Colin. New Zealand's super lucky to have you and have you solving such important issues as well. Um, so next up, we're going to head into presentations and each of our panellists will have around 10 minutes to dive a little bit deeper into their field. Um, so they're going to provide you with some extra context to help you understand the field that they operate in and also fill you in on the big emerging trends and areas of opportunities that they see. Uh, and just a reminder that if you have any questions for the panellists, you can pop them in the Q&A function in Zoom and we'll answer them at the end of the sessions. Uh, so first up, we have John. Thanks, Erin. Um, as far as trends coming through, we are seeing a lot of different trends and themes coming through. Um, but I think the clear thing is that whatever uh, trends and themes we are seeing right now may be completely different in 12 months' time, simply because that the early stage tech ecosystem is so dynamic, it's always evolving and always changing, and that's what's so exciting about it. Um, but just to give you four or five uh, examples right now of what we're, uh, what we're seeing, we're seeing a, a little bit of activity on electric vehicles, um, especially those kind of businesses with unique business models, um, content creation training, AR, VR related technologies, um, a big theme coming through. Um, you've probably heard of metaverse tech, um, metaverse tech is like it's a virtual environment where you can be present in digital spaces with other people so in, in AR VR. Uh, Facebook alone has been said to be spending around five billion dollars every year in metaverse related development so that's that's exciting for us. Health tech we are seeing a lot of opportunities come through um, on the health tech vertical especially femtech. Feminine tech is something that we are um, quite interested in and I'll give you an example of the type of company that we invested in there. Uh, deep tech, it's a fairly broad vertical, uh, but deep tech is um, tip, of the tip of the spear, sorry, um, innovation that's underpinned by um, advanced scientific or engineering expertise. So innovation that's really difficult to replicate, uh, but we're seeing some seriously smart people come up with some very unique solutions out of the New Zealand tech ecosystem. Um, and also SAS, I think New Zealanders, um, New Zealand entrepreneurs are very good at building and creating fast growing SAS companies. And um, so we're seeing a lot of deal flow with SAS companies, which is a fairly broad vertical. Um, but I must admit, uh, the valuations are starting to tick up a bit. So we are selectively looking at opportunities on the SAS side. So when I look at the first uh, theme, I think it's, um, yeah, electric vehicles. Um, I'm going to use Ubco. So Ubco is a utility electric motorbike company, and by utility I mean on-road and off-road. Um, the genesis of Ubco is that they were targeting uh, farming and agricultural type customers as their key initial target customer. And the great thing about this is, is that they built a bike to withstand incredibly difficult terrain. So uh, with a very rigorous kind of product. The great thing about um, that is that they have pivoted um, into like last mile delivery customers over the last few years. They're still selling through dealerships, but they are also targeting last mile delivery customers. So what is that? So it is large enterprise customers that have kind of like a delivery or transportation as a component of their business model. So for example, uh, they trialed their bikes with Domino's Pizza in New Zealand, and now they're going through a franchise by franchise nationwide rollout. Um, the bike is also um, connected as well through telematics. So you have a good understanding of where your bikes are at any one particular moment, and um, you have um, performance data coming through all the time. So you get to understand the performance of your bike over time. But Upco is one of the companies that we're super excited about 
Uh, you may or may not have heard, but the company is looking to list somewhere within the nine to 18 month period. So um, that's something that we're really excited about. Um, content creation, AR, VR. Um, and I'm going to talk about Stretch Sense. So, um, so Stretch Sense is a company that was created by two PhDs that came out of the University of Auckland. Uh, and Stretch Sense produced soft stretchy sensors that are integrated into clothing that gives you accurate and reliable data around the movement of your body. So they are focusing on the hand, sec um, hand part of the body. And I'm going to talk about two of the three key verticals that they're looking at. So versus content creation. So think of gaming, think of animated movies like Avatar, Alita, Marvel movies, uh, the Mandalorian series. Um, so at the moment, actors wear a bodysuit with sensors all over them. They act out a scene and the animator gets that data and they animate around the figure, right? And the head and the body are basically done you can get accurate and reliable data around the head and the body movement. But hands are so different. They're so difficult to get accurate and reliable data out of hands simply because of the, the degrees of freedom of the movement of your hands, right? Or you can interact with devices. Even crossing over your hands could distort or corrupt the data that comes out of um, hand products. So Street Sense is an absolute leader in the field of content creation for hands. And they are dealing with eight of the top 10 um, gaming studios in the world um, and are absolutely leading the charge. In fact, in current, um, and currently what animators do is chop the hands off and individually draw the hands in to their games and also um, uh, animated movies. It takes time, it costs money. So Stretch Sense's uh, product is an absolute game changer. So that's, that's um, content creation. And now this, the other vertical that I want to talk about is um, AR, VR training. I'm just going to give you a couple of examples. So say you are in a factory and you have like a, a complex piece of machinery that you want to learn how to use or construct. So you could use AR, VR goggles for the visual and stretch sense gloves for the haptics. Haptics give you the sens sensation of touch in the virtual world. So you can learn how to use and interact this piece of machinery. So by the time you get to the assembly line, you're already 80% trained and you've learned in a very safe environment. So that, that's the kind of innovation that we're seeing come out of Street Sense. And the application on the AR, VR training side is very broad. So you can have medical students learning how to do operational procedures um, at a very early stage um, as far as um, training and development is concerned. So, Seriously, tip of the ear, tip, tip of the spear type innovation coming through. Um, the other vertical that I want to talk about is uh, health tech and in particular femtech. So Genofem. Genofem is a really exciting um, medical device company that has come out of the Auckland Bioengineering Institute. It's a medical device company that targets um, women who are at the late stages of life have gone through childbirth and have pelvic floor issues. Um, the founder is a former midwife. Um, she is a pelvic floor researcher, PhD in pelvic floor simulation, um, an incredible, incredible lady. And she helped produce this device that is now in process with the NHS in the UK and being assessed as a reimbursable medical device for people who are pregnant and also for people who are women who are experiencing urinary incontinence issues. So um, instead of going through painful surgery, you can use this device, it's non-invasive and it helps you give back your quality of life. So huge benefits to society. Um, the Femtech vertical in particular, it's growing fast, 60% year on year. Um, and, you know, it's really a segment that we need to be investing in. Um, it's amazing that no other VC was touching this company, which such, um, it has such rich engineering and um, science-backed um, um, innovation. And more importantly for me, um, tapping an, um, like a huge market that has a real need. So um, we're really proud of um, investing in Junior for Fund 3. Um, as far as deep tech is concerned, I'm just going to go through a quick example, if you don't mind. So we have invested in a company called Dawn Aerospace. So it's a space tech company. 
Um, sustainable space tech focusing on green propulsion, so eco thrusters, and also reusable suborbital launch vehicles, so um, horizontal takeoff rather than vertical. So really exciting innovation coming through that um, we're really proud to be involved in. So you know these are the kind of opportunities that we are touching on a daily to day basis. They're addressing real pain points globally uh, with massive potential. Um, so we're really excited with how Fund 3 is starting to pan out. Um, but you know, we've only just started. Thanks, Erin. Fantastic. Thank you, John. Got a heap of questions about that, which I'll leave till the end. Um, over to you, Rebecca. Yeah, wow. Well, thanks, John. That was fascinating and uh, quite different to my day job. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about um, the drivers pushing growth in the renewable energy sector and opportunities, including um, shifts in technologies such as grid scale solar that we're starting to hear talked about a lot more now in the New Zealand market. Um, so what is driving growth in the electricity se sector? Well, decarbonisation is the big one. So we're looking at electrification and, and big areas that we can see really good gains here are process heat and transport. Um, retirement of thermal plant, that's another driver for growth in renewables. And um, on top of that, there, there is small underlying growth, but and it's moderated by efficiency. So the decarbonisation is really the main thing. So what are we projecting in terms of increased demand for renewables? I'm going to get Erin to share um, a few slides as I talk through. Um, who doesn't love a good graph? So the first one is um, from the Climate Change Commission report. And I think hopefully that's the very one um, that's coming up just there. Hopefully you can all sort of see that. Great, thanks Kylie or Erin. Um, what you can be, the key takeout from this, this is from the Climate Change Commission report that was released earlier this year. And it shows the anticipated increase in terms of electricity demand over time with the vertical dashed line being more or less where we are now and the far right of the graph being 2035. And what you see is that overall we're anticipating an increase of about 10 terawatt hours in electricity demand. The various um, stacks that you see in there represent the different technologies. So obviously there are some assumptions being made and you'll see a bit of a, a, a step down at one point in terms of available energy, which indicates some fossil fuel retirement. And uh, that step down is also around the time of the indicated exit of the smelter. So what, what does this mean? How can we put this in, in some kind of perspective? Um, to give you an idea of scale, our Harapaki wind farm, which we're building in Hawke's Bay at the moment, is 176 megawatts of solar. And that's the second largest solar farm in New Zealand. It has, um, sorry, not solar, wind, um, second largest wind farm in New Zealand. And wind has a capacity factor of about 35%. So that will produce about 540 gigawatt hours per annum. So if we think we need 10 terawatt hours per annum increase by 2035, that's over 18 of these really large wind farms um, in 14 years. Our wind farm is costing 395 million. So multiply that out over 18 of those. We need more than just Meridian being successful in bringing new generation online to meet these demands. Um, you can stop sharing that graph and we will move to the next one down, which is a very good, thank you. Okay, so moving on from projections there of how much additional demand we might need through to which technologies are being predicted to meet the increased demand. And, and this slide helps us unpick it a bit. So um, we've got the levelized cost of electricity on, on the y-axis with New Zealand dollars per megawatt hour and, um, and, and time across the x. What you can see is that you can now build renewables cheaper than you can run geothermal, um, sorry, run thermal, and there is a bit of geothermal left. 
there is no one tech winner. We believe that there is room for a number of different technologies and it comes down to cost, quality and speed. If you've got a wind site that is more expensive than a good grid scale solar site, why wouldn't you build the solar? And so what you're starting to see there now is that um, grid scale solar is really starting to get into the money after a really steady decline in tech costs in recent years. And you'll see that rooftop solar is actually still relatively expensive. This is not my area of expertise, but I'll, I'll just touch on it really briefly. Um, for industrial, commercial and residential actors, they have different drivers to the large gen tailors like Meridian. And so they're comparing a relatively smaller potential investment with the retail price of power that they face, whereas we're looking at the wholesale market price of power. Um, so I'll just leave that there for now, but I'll continue to focus on more of the grid scale stuff. Um, so as we look at the costs for new build and some challenges in the electricity market that we've seen lately, um, people do start to ask some questions. And if we could move to the next slide, this will help us talk to that. So there is a common trilemma when it comes to energy, which is energy security, energy equity, and environmental sustainability. And we are trying to keep these in balance. The World Energy Council ranked New Zealand nine out of 125 countries in this trilemma back in 2017. So how do we work to take our what was then rated as a top 10 system and transport it through to 2035 intact and well balanced? And that is going to be an art that we need to figure out. If we start with security, that's uh, reasonably topical after what is now being termed Black Monday of the 9th of August this year, where we saw blackouts. Um, I think we'd all agree there is zero tolerance for lights out, both politically and socially. We need fast, flexible electricity. If we're trying to decarbonize and we're taking out some of that thermal flexibility, storage capable hydro increasingly fills that role. But if you are both low on gas and your lake levels are low, you start to see that there is a need for more flex in the system. And the New Zealand Climate Change Commission believe there is still a role for fast, flexible gas peaking, um, but that's looking more uncertain. We believe that there is a massive opportunity for demand flexibility, and you will have heard in the media that Meridian are doing some um, research with Contact Energy into uh, green hydrogen and the potential that this could have, both as an emerging market in New Zealand, but also to help provide some of that flex that we would need for dry periods um, when we don't have enough hydro to use that for the flex. Um, so the, again, there is just such an art of how we're going to navigate this transition and put flexibility back into the market where we're taking it out because we want to decarbonize. Moving to another corner of the triangle, price equity. Um, I think we're, we're all aware that there has been significant discussion and questions being asked around the cost of electricity in New Zealand. And showing prices above cost of entry isn't enough to establish a market problem. There, there also has to be a reason to think that prices are going to remain at an elevated level and that there are some kind of enduring barriers to entry or expansion or drivers that will pull people away from that. So what are some possible reasons for wholesale prices being above those long run entry costs that I showed on the previous graph? As a starter and as a head of a renewable development team, um, it takes time. You can't suddenly turn on a new plant um, and there are going to be some periods of dis disequilibrium while markets are adjusting. So new generation is large, they're multi-year projects. Consenting these projects is not straightforward or fast and we're watching with real interest what the government is looking at doing um, 
around resource management and, and consenting. Um, plus prospective investors in new generation have faced an enormous amount of uncertainty over the last few years. And that includes government climate change policies and the future of natural gas. Um, changes in the transmission network pricing and uncertainty there around what we'll be paying. Uh, the proposition of the enormous virtual battery of Lake Onslow that's being proposed for the South Island. The future of large electricity users such as the TY Point aluminium smelter, and this one's huge for Meridian. The smelter currently uses I think about 13% of all of New Zealand's generation. And with significant reductions in gas availability and flexibility coupled with periods of low lake levels, you can see how price volatility could be um, a feature of the electricity wholesale market. Moving to the third corner of the trilemma, um, sustainability, and this is a big one for my team. Um, I think we'd all agree that COVID has just given us even more time to think about what really matters to us. And um, with the International Panel on Climate Change and New Zealand's own Climate Change Commission, there is a huge amount of information out there and food for thought. But we really do have um, a commitment to the decarbonisation of New Zealand and Meridian's goal of clean energy for a fairer, healthier world talks to the balance of this trilemma. We want it to be environmentally sustainable. We do want it to be equitable and we do need to think really carefully around how we're doing this. That brings security as well. So I would say there are um, a huge number of opportunities in this space. We certainly need more than just Meridian acting if we're going to get that extra 10 terawatt hours that's being projected by 2035. We need a lot of people in the game to achieve the good balance as we decarbonise. So rounding out, uh, the drivers pushing growth in the renewable energy sector are largely linked to decarbonisation and the link of that to retirement of old thermal plant. And the cost of technology is definitely coming down, which is exciting. And we are going to see more um, grid scale solar coming online as well as, as competitive wind. And, and that crossover point where sometimes solar will actually be um, a better choice than the next best wind farm. And I think I'll, I'll leave it there and hand back to you, Erin, and look forward to some questions. Fantastic. Thank you, Rebecca. It's the first time I've um, come across the energy trilemma, and I found that a really good way of understanding what's going on in the industry. Um, Colin, over to you. Thanks, Erin. Um, so I'll just start off in the, in the last three months. So between, between the end of June and uh, today, the, the, the carbon price has increased from about 50%, so from about between 43 and $44 to about six, roughly $65 uh, today. And, and that creates quite a large opportunity and um, also um, uh, you know, a, a, an incentive for, for change, as, as Rebecca's just actually touched on a, a lot of this, making um, what new projects that Rebecca has been talking about much, much more viable. Um, but what I'll do is I'll, I'll back up the bus and just say, articulate how, how we've actually got to, got to this point, because up until fairly recently, carbon was a, was a black box, really, and people didn't fully, fully understand it. And prior to the 1990s, re really, the, the background is that to, to pollute was free. We didn't we didn't have to pay for um, polluting the atmosphere and putting carbon dioxide or equivalent to that into the atmosphere. We um, nobody nobody really had to pay for it financially anyway. And so, uh, what's happened since the the late nineties, early two thousands, is that there's been a steady shift to be towards going, well, no, actually, you do have to pay for the, the, the impact that you have on, on the climate. But in New Zealand in particular, the handbrake has, has been on over, over the last 10 or 15 years. There's been, well, you've had to pay. Um, 
New Zealanders uh, in New Zealand, we've had initiatives such as paying for every two tons of um, carbon equivalent you emit, you you pay for one. There were fixed prices for um, carbon, be it for one ton of carbon being twenty five dollars per ton, and then last year uh, the the fixed price was thirty five dollars per ton. There were large free allocations to trade. Uh, exposed industries. So, like an example is the smelter. You know, um, to to try and keep them here, what is good for the economy. We we were giving up the people paying for the cost of their emissions. And then the, the really really big one is that agriculture has been excluded from having to pay for for their emissions. So, and there's a big project underway to for. for for actually ag agriculture to pay for, for their emissions and, and future. So stayed up, up until a couple of years ago, as I say, the handbrake has been on in terms of people paying for um, the impact that they have on the climate. But now the steady shift towards um, acknowledging climate change and saying, hey, we've actually got a climate, climate emergency here. We need to do something about it. And it starts with actually paying appropriately for the impact that we have on the environment. And so what we're seeing now is that that industrial allocation that I talked about, you know, from, I, I used the example of the smelter, that, that's dropping away over time. That, that's going to drop away over the next few years. Um, there's no fixed price option for meeting your um, carbon liabilities. Uh, the government has, has introduced an auctioning regime where they've actually set a price that a minimum price of twenty dollars which is going to increase over time and they've put in place a soft cap the soft cap being that if the um, price gets too high the government puts units into their their auction to hopefully keep the the price suppressed that actually got triggered in the last auction on the first of September uh, and uh, that you know the the, the price um, went significantly higher than that. That that soft cap it was fifty three dollars eighty five at that point. There is market sentiment saying that actually for for people to meet the cost of their emissions, that the, you know that that price is going to go higher, and there's more people having to pay more for 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 um for more emissions that they're putting into the environment, um and. The reality of it, as we've seen in the last few weeks, as I say, the price has gone to nearly $65 a tonne, and we expect that that is going to increase significantly over the next few years. So in the compliance market, I'm going to talk about compliance. That's um, uh, industries that have to pay for their emissions, and it's usually the people who produce energy uh, that, that need to do so, or waste. Um, those people, the cost for them to comply uh, is going to increase substantially, and that is going to impact all of us because it will come through the price that you pay for your fuel um, and the price that you pay for your electricity, as, as Rebecca was touching on before. So it does have an impact on us. The other, the other factor that's driving driving this this market growth and this demand for carbon is that. A number of organisations have woken up to, to uh, environmental responsibility and they've said, well, hang on a minute, we, um, we need to maintain our social licence to operate and we know that everything we do is being judged from an environmental perspective as well as a commercial and the quality of our product perspective. So a number of businesses have taken an active step to say, hey, I'm going to pay for my emissions. And not only that, companies like Google are looking at paying all the way back to when they first formed. So they're they're taking care of legacy emissions. And that they see that as a key driver for them um, maintaining that social license to operate. And that that's in something that we call the voluntary market. And we see I see that that's only really scratch the surface. There's going to be so many organisations coming into the into the market. New Zealand Post is one recently that's you know they, they they're saying that they're carbon carbon neutral, and there's going to be more and more businesses looking to do this 
over time creating quite a big demand and quite a large market for um, carbon and a number of ways of, of doing that. The last thing is really banks are, are, are looking at people who invest sustainably. So what you're doing about your um, carbon emissions is becoming really, really important in terms of sourcing capital going forward. So businesses, whether they like to or not, are going to have to address this matter sooner, sooner rather than later. Um, so in terms of opportunities and, and, and carbon and what this what this means over the next few years, I, I definitely think that, that there's going to be trading opportunities. You know, if you look at I'm not going to tell you whether the carbon price is low or high today, but if you take a view and say that, hey, it's sitting at $65, but really we're not going to incentivise behavioural change in New Zealand until that carbon price reaches $150, then there's a lot of opportunities to invest in carbon at $65 today um, and tra trading in it because people are actually going to, to, you know, to need it. Uh, and there's a lot um, of speculators actually coming into the market and scooping up units. Um, if you t take as an example, people are looking across the world uh, at, at carbon prices, saying that they're too low. New Zealand is at $65 um, today. You know, in the UK, it's about £60. So what's that, about $100 to $120? You know, and in Europe, it's about €60, €65. Euros. So, we, we see that the, pre, the the opportunity there, the opportunity set is, is quite large. The other opportunity, which you know lends to you, you know what I'm doing um, day in day out at the moment, is is in forestry. And um, what one of the one of the ways to actually source carbon credits is to plant trees, because trees as trees grow, um, they uh, roughly fifty percent of the tree is carbon. They, that's stored in the tree uh, and, until you harvest it, of course. And so there'll be quite a lot of people being opportunistic at the moment, thinking, hey, well, can I invest in forestry, generate carbon, and that can give me a good commercial return? So there's a lot of opportunity there um, that, that is being evaluated. I know, know a number of people are already doing it um, to around um, carbon itself as opposed to the, the emissions reduction um, opportunity and new technologies. What what one thing the last thing I'd just like to to leave you with is is that this market, you know, whether whether it's going to a question I've been asked is our oh, carbon it's, it's just going to go away, isn't it? Well I I, I don't I don't really necessarily think that's the case. We're we're always going to be creating carbon emissions we we might be net zero and that that's nice but we're always going to have to from now pay for polluting as we pollute we have to pay for it in some way and that that will be a financial i would imagine a financial cost so we had in the past that uh, we didn't get charged anything then we had limits on what we're going to be charged now it can be anything and i think into the future that is exactly what's going to be the case for us it's going to be anything but the market is always going to be there it might not be as big as it is today but it will cer certainly always be there so there's there's definitely some really big opportunities in in carbon super interesting it um at Shearsies, we actually became carbon neutral a couple of months ago and bought some carbon credits, I think, at around the $50 mark. And it's crazy to think that that decision would have been 30% or something more expensive for us if we had made it a few weeks later. And is obviously going to be more expensive for us probably into the future as well, unless we reduce our emissions. Um, thanks a lot for that, Colin. We've got a few questions coming through now, mostly for Colin and Rebecca at the moment. So if you have any questions for John, jump in there too. Um, but the first question we have is for Colin and Rebecca. Do you expect New Zealand carbon prices to continue its upward trend in the near future, especially with 138 million of credits in stockpile? Are you concerned about that stockpile? Who wants to go first, Rebecca? Ladies first. 
Oh, well, thank you. Um, yeah, Meridian mm. Meridian is concerned about the, um, the price of carbon. Mm. And our response to that is that we have a program called Forever Forests, where we're actually planting our own um, trees to offset. And they are not for harvesting, so they are forever forests. So we're looking for marginal land and looking to plant around 1,100 hectares um, and using that to offset some of our own carbon emissions because it's cost, it's cost effective versus um, the price of carbon. So yeah, definitely. We also have um, huge initiatives to try and decrease our own carbon emissions and, and targets for doing that. I'll hand over to Colin for more of the detailed carbon market. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, thanks, Rebecca. Um, so I guess, um, you know, in terms of the, the, the upward trend in carbon prices, all the signals are there that they, they are going to increase. Um, so, so they could do. Um, what, one thing about the stockpile, yeah, I think it, it just it depends where where they are as to whether they're going to be used because some of those um, units will be used to to meet harvesting liabilities, um, but the rest of those units actually do do need to be used. Um, so that that's something that the government I know is actively looking at and saying, well, how many how many more units do we want to put into the market? Because does that just make that stockpile grow and grow? Uh, and the price will grow and grow and it's you're artificially um you, you know increasing the price because in the future as soon as those units get put into the market, um, you know, it it depresses the price all at one go and that's that's not very good from from a market perspective. So um yeah, the stockpile does give me cause for concern, um, but we don't know in New Zealand what that true stockpile figure actually is that, that's able to be used to meet obligations. And one more question for Rebecca. Um, Rebecca, do you see the battery of the nation, the Onslow pump storage, as a threat or an opportunity for Meridian? Could it be an opportunity if it's going to take seven terawatt hours, I hope I've got that right, to fill the lake, then this could be a great opportunity to supply the spare electricity during the TY, TY point transition. Yeah, um, it's, a, it's a really interesting question. Um, sure, there will be opportunity for electricity supply during the filling of that lake. Um, I guess as, as a dam engineer, there are some fascinating aspects of the project. Um, my, my queries around it, I guess, are the cost, um, because estimated costs have a habit of blowing out. And if you want to have a look at that, uh, a good case study to look at at the moment would be um, the Snowy Hydro Pump Storage Scheme that is under construction at the moment. And go and have a look at the estimated price blowout they're expecting on that one. And um, I mean, we as, as New Zealanders are going to be the ones paying for this, right? Um, that hasn't quite been resolved how that will happen, but ultimately it'll be all of us. And I guess I just question um, whether that's the best and the most economic way for us to hit that challenge. Um, whether we could do better with a bit of diversification and looking at some options in the North Island as well, because if that battery is in the South Island, we've got the same um, restriction over the, the DC link between the islands still. Um, and I do think we really have to look at um, the benefits of flexible demand as well as potentially better from an economic perspective for all of us. Mm. Thanks, Rebecca. I've got one more question for Colin, then we'll jump into some questions for John. Um, Colin, is there a mechanism for individual retail investors to invest directly into carbon units under the ETS? Um, so th th there are funds that you can actually invest into, um, which gives you the pr probably the most direct exposure. Um, <clears throat> that that's that's probably the best option for any individual or retail investor to to go with it with a fund. Cool, thanks. Yeah. Um, and John, question for you. 
What would you advise young, intelligent New Zealand students to be learning to be successful businesses? Um, and we want business that can stay in New Zealand and two businesses that the global market is looking for. Yeah, that, that, that's a really good question. And I don't think I've ever been asked that before, but um, I would say uh, depending, depending on how old the person is, um, just try and get involved with a company that is already in existence and either like focusing on the local market or scaling globally. Um, because um, the, you know there's there's no um, there's uh, no substitute for actual experience and getting your hands dirty, either that or starting your own company, and it's really difficult to do that. Um, but you know if you've got an idea and you think it's going to um, have traction, then first of all speak to as many people as possible, like um, online and person not just your family and friends because they'll probably tell you what you want to hear rather than the truth but um but also some people um even though you may get uh, negative feedback sometimes ignoring that as well and just um following your passion and just taking the leap into early stage company investment and and um starting your own thing is really important so you can get heaps of data and feedback from people either online in international markets or you know in new zealand but you know, just keep on speaking to people, uh, speak to customers, potential customers, just find out exactly what what they want and what their pain point is. And can you actually provide a solution that can meet that pain point? Um, so yeah, either start um, working for an early stage company, um, whether as an intern or, or otherwise, or, you know, just start your own company. Bit of a follow-up question on that. You mentioned early on that when you're looking at potential investments, you really look at the founders and the team and they're really important for you deciding on whether it's going to be a successful business or not. Yeah. What kind of qualities are you looking for in, in those teams when you're making that sort of assessment? Yeah, it's uh, that's another interesting question. The value is, is always in the team. Like, it really does matter. Um, but, you know, the ability to be, especially from the, the top, you know, the management point of view, how they handle culture, how, what kind of culture they want. And leadership and great culture, um, you know, sometimes can be difficult to find. But, um, you know, if you're, if you're not creating great culture in person, then if you're going to be going to lockdown and working remotely, then that is the wrong time to set culture because it's so much harder to build culture remotely. But um, so leadership, um, transparency and leadership so, um, style, communication, uh, strong communicators are, are really key to, you know, just to win over employees, customers, partners. Um, yeah, and also teams with, um, I like teams with domain expertise and whatever they're trying to solve. So it just helps them move quickly with confidence. Um, so yeah, um, uh, culture, leadership, communication and experience. Fantastic. I might just ask you one tiny quick uh, last question, and that is, do you use any metrics on sustainability to decide what to invest in? Oh, if you ask me this question in, say, a month's time, I think I might be better prepared to answer it. Um, the answer is yes and no. Um, but at the moment, we're coming up with the framework um, with how to invest with the lens of sustainability, but at the same time, kind of maximizing financial returns. So that project is in motion right now. Um, and we've got a couple of local advisory group members like titans of the industry that have a real passion for this, um, for ESG investing. Um, but also um, our latest hire, Heather Gadano, she is an incredible um, uh, part of uh, Globe from day one, where she is our CMO kind of operating partner, helping our companies with go-to-market strategies. But she's also got experience um, studying environmental, um, with environmental studies and sustainable development at university. Um, and she's helping kind of build out this framework. Um, we're also UN principles of responsible investment and um, um, signatories of, and also members of the uh, Responsible Investment Australasian Association. So we're helping to build out this, we're, we're in the process of building out the framework now on how to measure it and report it. I can't really tell you the, the, um, the metrics now, but you know, if we have another discussion in a month or so time, I think I'll be in a better position to, um, to come back to you. Fantastic. We're actually out of time for today, so we won't be able to make it through all of the questions, unfortunately. But 
Thank you all for joining us today. And thank you so much to our panelists, Rebecca, Colin and John for sharing their expertise and knowledge with us. Really appreciate your time. And I know I've learned a lot and I hope everyone watching has as well. Thank, thank you. you.